lecture talking about rigid alignment of surfaces, right? And uh, in particular, we spent quite some time on the ICP algorithm and, and mentioning all kinds of different variants, right? That try and essentially seek different features that are kind of easy to grab onto in a line. Uh, but then, one kind of issue with ICP is it only aligns two surfaces at a time, right? And uh, further, at least the kind of middle room that, that, that we define. And, and beyond that, um, ICP we know is very prone to error, right? That, that it really depends on your, your initial estimate. Right? And so both of those things together mean that really, if I want to align a whole collection of scans or a whole collection of 3D objects, probably it's not super smart to like align them all using ICP independently to one object or you know, use all these different heuristics. And it's pretty easy to break them pretty fast. Right? And so one of the kind of interesting models here, or, or, or one question you could ask would be, let's say that I have a whole collection of scans and I run ICP pairwise. And with some probability, I think that ICP will succeed, right? So every once in a while, ICP will give me the right alignment, and all of those alignments agree, and otherwise, ICP gives me, you know, random numbers, which is essentially true, right? Like, if you, if you give a bad initial guess to ICP, you know, I'm sure there are certain bases of attraction for alignment, but they're, they're pretty much kind of just yucky and, and, and well distributed away from the, the optimum for, for a lot of students. This is a very generic statement, so you should check it. Uh, but that aside, uh, you know, then you might ask a question which is, like, given a pairwise estimate of rotation from A to B, rotation from B to C, rotation from A to C, and so on, all the possible pairs, can I then do, solve some other problem that tries to make them consistent, right? Like extracts a consistent set of rigid motions that puts everybody into one coordinate frame. And that problem uh, is known in the applied math world as synchronization. Yeah? So I have, essentially, a higher level version of synchronization is I have a bunch of estimates of the relationships between pairs of objects in a set, and I want to sort of extract from that a global statement about the entire set. Okay, so this is a good example. Does everybody kind of get this set up? So first of all, I, I mean, you, you do have to realize that the, the synchronization problem itself, uh, you don't expect there to be like one answer in the sense that if I put everybody in the same coordinate frame and then I rotated that coordinate frame, then somehow I haven't changed my alignment, right? I've, I've, the pairwise relationship is still conserved, which is, is in some sense what makes this problem so hard, right? That like you don't expect there to be like some complex optimization problem you can just solve that extracts the global alignment, because if there were, there'd be some kind of uniqueness that that, that, that you're really happy. Yeah? So uh, right, so we're not going to talk about the fully generic version of, of synchronization, which would be like pairwise rigid motions in 3D. Because it turns out that's actually an open problem. Uh, and, and, and I mean, there, there are plenty of kind of heuristic ways out there, and, and, and people continue to study this, but the mathematical understanding of this problem is still pretty limited. Uh, but there is a version of this problem uh, which is much better understood, and it's the one that I have on the screen. And this is synchronization of two-dimensional rotations. And the reason that we're going to start here uh, is that essentially, uh, for one thing, going from 2D to 3D, we'll see, is not super hard. We can kind of suggest that in a few moments. Um, the, actually, the kind of strange thing here is that it's going from rotation to rotation plus translation that ends up being really challenging. Uh, uh, but for a lot of contexts, you actually don't need to worry about that, right? So in fact, this literature, like if you if you take a look at this paper that I'm citing here, um, what the ACHA stands for Applied Computational Harmonic Analysis, slightly different uh, place than where we're usually grabbing papers uh, for this class. But but anyway, uh, where it originally comes up um, is is in a world called a uh, cryoelectron microscopy. Right? Uh, how many of you guys have heard of cryonia before? Yeah, okay, well, we should just talk about it a little bit. But essentially, the, uh, the idea here is let's say that I have some biological, biological macromolecules, the operative phrase in, in that world. So some like giant messed up protein, that I, I wanna, and I want to know the shape of that protein. Right? That's my job. And unfortunately, you know, certain, certain molecules like DNA crystallize. And then you can do kind of macro scale measurements about the crystal that tell you things about the micro scale structure of DNA, for example. But some, you know, just kind of messed up proteins that are just squiggly and weird don't crystallize. So you can't, you can't do this nice trick. Um, and, and, and so for those kinds of molecules, uh, cryoM is an interesting modality because what it does is it allows you to just kind of do the equivalent of like take a picture of this thing rather than try and do something clever uh, to, to get nice structure. So in cryoM, which happens to be a phrase that's very difficult to say, cryo-EM. Uh, what you do is you take a sample of your, your macromolecule, you do a bunch of different copies of it, like you know, I have a little fluid and it's suspended in there, and I freeze it, and then 
you take like a little thin razor blade and you shave a layer off the top, and you put that layer into the electron microscope. And so what the electron microscope gives you roughly uh, is like I have you know my molecule here, and I have the imaging plane of the microscope sitting down there, and so I point I point my electron microscope <coughs> this way. It sends beams through, and then I have a collector down here, right? And so at the end of the day, what this thing measures is kind of the line integral of the mass along every line from the top, you know, from the eye down to the bottom. And, and this is a pretty common thing, right? Like if you get an X-ray, it doesn't off. You get a very similar physical movement. Uh, but there are, two different, there are two differences between cryo-EM and like getting an X-ray. Uh, one of which is that like as, as humans, we're a heck of a lot more compliant than, than uh, biological micromolecules, right? In particular, if I tell you to put your leg here and stay there, you, you do, yeah? Um, whereas in cryo-EM, you have no control over the orientation of this molecule, right? What happens is you suspend it in this fluid, you freeze it, and then that's just what you got, is whatever rotation is in that frozen thing. And to make matters worse, you don't even know the rotation, right? So what you end up with is a bunch of x-rays of an object where you don't know the angle of the x-ray, yeah? And the signal-to-noise ratio of these images is like ridiculously, ridiculously small. So if you Google for cryo-EM image, I, I encourage you to do that. Essentially what it looks like is an old TV set, like it's just, it's just white noise, right? So it's amazing that you get any signal out of this at all. But you can scan a hell of a lot of these molecules and then hope that somehow there's this tiny, tiny amount of signal hiding in that noise and your job is to extract it. So in, in, in the cryom pipeline, at least one potential cryom pipeline, what you do is you say, okay, I take a bunch of these different images of the same molecule. Incidentally, they're not actually like the same molecule like object, they're a, a bunch of copies of the same molecule, okay? Um, which should make you suspicious because a lot of molecules like flex about different points. But if you ignore that, that's about heterogeneity. Um, then essentially, between every pair of images, maybe you can come up with a super, super, super rough estimate of the rotation from one image into the other, right? And, like using some very heuristic trick. So in fact, uh, if you go over common lines, there's, this is one way to do it in, in, in Fourier transform. And, uh, the problem is that this noise, this this measurement is hor horrendous, right? This, this 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 kind of pairwise rotation, like maybe has the tiniest tiniest amount of signal, and that's only if your you know electron microscope is successful, and a lot of other stuff is true for a good example, right? And so what you get is exactly this kind of data, where you get a bunch of images, and between every pair of images, you have kind of a bad estimation of the rotation. But if you have, you have this assumption that if you have enough of them, the, the bad estimates kind of cancel destructively and what you can extract is, is the good ones. Yeah? And then once you have the positions of the camera for each of the images, then it's not so hard to reconstruct. Then, then, then it becomes just like you, you know, putting your, your leg into an x ray. Yeah? Uh, so, anyway, that's kind of the context where this stuff came up. And then, of course, this is kind of the two dimensional version. There you need 3D, but it turns out that um, that, that transition is not so bad. Um, in the cryo-EM world, it's pretty easy to get rid of uh, translation when you synchronize because you kind of just center these things about the center of mass. Uh, but there are contexts where you want translation as well. So that's our, your motivation. Um, so anyway, at the end of the day, if we're solving two-dimensional angular synchronization, which is probably not on the screen here, then what you're given as data are pairwise estimates of the relative motion between two rotations. Right? So the way to think about it is like, Maybe my data points, you know, are a bunch of points in a circle, right? And between any two of these points, what I can give you is the angle between them, like this, this angle here, yeah? And so you get a bunch of measurements of that form. And your question is, can you reconstruct the positions of these points? Now, first of all, given uh, observations of this form, again, like if you took the circle and just rotated the whole thing, you get the same set of observations, so you only expect to get it up to uh, a constant shift. Cool? All right. So our data, at the end of the day, the input data that we get, is a bunch of pairwise motions that look like delta ij is, right? So this would be like the angle theta i is like the position. What you get is theta i minus theta j. Let me make sure my sign agrees with the screen here. Yep. And of course, I could add 2 pi to this, and it, and it wouldn't matter, right? So really, this is, you can think of this kind of modulo 2 pi, yeah? And our question is, but the problem is that these might not be 
consistent. So for instance, uh, one thing you might expect, of course, is if you have theta i minus j, theta k, or, oh, theta i minus theta j, plus theta j minus theta k, plus theta k minus theta i, then I get zero. But that may not happen. In other words, like if I have delta i j plus delta k k plus delta k i, well, what I'd like is zero, but maybe because of my measurement system or something, I didn't get it. Right? So if they were all zero, then I could extract this, this information, but because they're not, I have to do something to get rid of that noise. Cool? All right. And like I mentioned at the very end of class last time, um, one ambiguity that we can get rid of pretty easily uh, is this, this 2 pi thing, right? And, and you remember, how are, how are we going to do that? Like, rather than working with unknown set of thetas, yeah, uh, magic. Yeah, we're going to use complex numbers, exactly. So in particular, I'm going to define the, um, I'm realizing now that the index i is probably not a good thing. I'll, I'll try to use a cursive i, but hopefully from context you can tell. Uh, right, uh, this is going to be e to the cursive i. Uh, yeah. Cool? Uh, I already have a j there too, so, uh, yeah. I guess I can write the square root of minus one. I think you guys can figure it out. If it's on top of an e, then it's, it's common. Yeah? Okay. Uh, right. So, does anyone have a reasonable model? Like, how could I, how could I solve this optimization problem? It's actually not so obvious, right? In a way that has any kind of guarantee at all. You know, similar to like when we were talking about uh, normalized cuts, for example, you know, and what we were after was some notion of optimality for this problem, for some version of this problem. And it's actually, it's very difficult to write down a problem whose solution is the solution to the synchronization problem. And the reason is, is this 2 pi ambiguity, or not the 2 pi ambiguity, but rather the global shift that you have, right? It's so easy to deal with that. Yeah. So you can think of a sort of heuristics, right? For instance, maybe I just assume theta 1 is 0, and then I work everything from there. But as you can imagine, somehow, any, any way that I write a problem that way is going to somehow favor theta 1 over all the other thetas, unless I'm really careful about it. So maybe, maybe that's not the best thing to do. Yeah? So instead, we're going we're gonna to come up with, with a couple different alternatives here. Yeah? So first of all, Let's, let's start with this, this relationship over the, the deltas here. Uh, and, and in fact, let's just exponentiate both sides. Yeah? So, so what do I get? Well, at the end of the day, if I take this, I'm going to get e to the um, delta ij times the complex i yeah? is equal to e to the complex i theta i um, e to the minus yeah? And uh, we're now going to give these things names, right? Remember, we call the zi and zi, zj. Um, where this is like z. Oh. And uh, we're also going to give a name. Uh, never mind, I don't want to. OK, we're good. <laughs> yeah. So I never way of writing this relationship. Remember, like we talked about last time, and instead of times your ratio, you should get rid of it, because that just makes life worse in optimization. Uh, we can say that. Uh, Make sure my sign agrees with my notes. Uh, Z i minus e to the i. Cool. So if I have uh, oh, thanks. There you go. <laughs> you see that this these two expressions are the same. Uh, I didn't was multiplied both sides by z j and subtract. So that's the basic relationship that we want to consider. And the question is, how can, we, how can we optimize for a bunch of z's that satisfy this relationship? And they also have to satisfy another uh, property. Can, can you guys see what that property is? Like, what, uh, For example, are there z's that are illegitimate for my problem? Do I have a constraint? Matt? Yeah. Uh, in particular, remember that I'm thinking of z as e to the i theta, but if I'm going to drop that theta variable, then I better convince myself that I, put, I can put a constraint on z so that there exists a theta. In other words, I can take the complex log. So what I need is that is that they, they all have unit length. And it turns out, yet another way of thinking about why the synchronization problem is hard is that somehow this constraint is difficult to enforce for more than one z at a time. 
if you only have one Z, uh, then we uh, then it comes like an eigenvalue function. And we're actually going to come back to that. Okay. So anyway, what we're looking for is a bunch of ZIs that are all unit length and approximately satisfy this relationship up here. Cool so far? Good. Okay. So I can give you two different uh, realizations of this problem, two different ways to solve it. And the nice thing is that like these are these are things that actually are, are pretty easy to implement at home. You can just give them a try. Uh, and these uh, correspond to eigenvalue and, and semi-definite programs, uh, which is pretty common in, in, in the sort of complex realization where you kind of come up with one eigenvalue realization, one STP each. By the way, do you guys know what a semi-definite program is? <laughs> Not everybody. So uh, uh, a semi-definite program is an optimization problem where you're unknown as a matrix, and you have a constraint that that matrix is, is positive semi-definite. Yeah. And remember that a uh, set of positive semi-definite matrices is itself a convex set. Like if I average two things with all positive eigenvalues, I get a third thing with all positive eigenvalues. So that's somehow like an okay constraint to have. Cool? All right. We're not going to talk about how to solve STPs in this class, because that's, that's hard. Um, okay. But not NP. Okay, so anyway, we're going to, uh, we're going to define a matrix. Um, and we're going to call him H. Um, and he's going to be e to the i delta ij. I know it's not great, but hopefully you guys can understand the different i's. Uh, and in particular, I'm going to assume that I don't have this relationship, this delta ij, for every single pair. That's a lot of deltas. But rather that I get, I have some set e. And this is like the set of edges where I have a relationship, and on the other edges I just don't have any information. Yeah? This is a slightly more general version of the problem. So what I'm going to do is define this matrix Hij so that if I have delta Ij, um, uh, oops, that should be E. So if I have a delta Ij, then I put the, the, the complex exponent of my matrix. And otherwise, I just put or that element. And otherwise, I put. <coughs> oh, and I'm just gonna I'm gonna keep that there because it's gonna make my life a little easier in notation. Okay. So generally, I mean, what is our approach in this class? And we're we're trying to solve for a bunch of thetas. We don't know what they are. We try to write down some optimization problem, right? Write down some objective that's either maximized or minimized on sort of the set that we're happy with, and then we're gonna we talk a lot about how to optimize it. Right? This is the variational approach. Uh, to geometry problems, and this is no different. In particular, but the, the actual objective function I give you is a little bit not obvious, but it's it's kind of sneaky because it emits a lot of really nice relaxations. So first of all, let's say that I do satisfy this you know relationship for for delta ij, right? And I look at the following uh, number. I take e to the i. Delta ij plus theta j minus theta i. And let's say that the, the theta i, j, the theta i, and theta j agree with this delta. Yeah. Then what is this number? Rafael. What does it say after if up there? If i and j are in the set of edges, like are 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 a pair of images that you have data. Okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Maybe I'll just be right. I didn't have my coffee today. <sighs> um, right. So if if theta i, theta j, and delta are all consistent, then what is what is first of all what is the sum? Zero, right? Because by definition, this is the, the difference of these two guys. Yeah. Let's e to the zero. One. Yeah. Now let's say so. This is a complex number. And think about the real and the imaginary components of that complex number, right? These correspond to cosine of this angle and sine of this angle. Yeah? Now, what do we know about cosine and sine? What's the biggest value they can take? What? Yeah? So in other words, this thing maximizes the real part of this number when these three things agree. <coughs> you see that? So if I take this objective, Right? And I try to maximize it over the thetas, right? If the thetas, if I can find a, a set of thetas that are consistent with delta, then the maximum is going to be just a bunch of ones. Does our setup make sense here? So in general, what do you think our optimization problem is going to be? Well, you know, I want this number to be big for every pair. Yeah? So what I'm going to do 
is sum over all ij in the set of edges. And what I want to do is maximize this thing with respect to all of the theta ones. That's going to be our optimization problem. Do you see that? And you see that the, the, should there be a set of thetas that are consistent with this delta, I can get them from this optimization. So the sentence parsing of the Cool. All right, so uh, our first job is to, to take our objective function and make it a little less annoying, right? Because this is, this is a pretty terrible function in terms of the theta. It's right? sitting inside of an exponential, and then I take a real part, so really there's like a cosine sitting inside of here. Like, uh, life isn't so good so far, yeah? But thankfully, I've made a lot of definitions that are gonna make our life, our life easier, yeah? So, so let's simplify a little bit. We have the sum over i, j, in your set of edges, again, of the real part, uh, e to the i delta i j plus theta uh, j plus theta i. That, just going to copy it over. Yeah. And now we gotta, we're going to start simplifying. So first of all, we, we define some, some numbers that are going to help us out. right? So remember the e to the sum is the product of the e's? Yeah, hopefully we do remember that properly. Okay. Uh, so in other words, what can I say? This is the real part of what? So, well, you have e to the i theta j. Yeah? So that's like z j, using our definition over there. Yeah? Then we have e to the i delta ij, we're just going to leave that for a second. Yeah. And then we have e to the minus, i minus theta i. Do you, do you remember what that's called when I have e to the i theta and e to the minus i theta? These numbers are what of each other? Convex conjugates, right? So in other words, uh, I can write z i bar conjugate. Yeah? Okay, so it's starting to look a little bit. A little less, yeah? Okay. So now we're going to do two things. So first of all, the real part of a sum is the sum of the real parts. So I can move the real to the outside. Um, uh, z i bar e to the i delta i j z i j. Okay. All right. So now, uh, for my next trick, I'm going to say, okay, so we define a matrix that has this, these numbers in it. Yeah. In particular, that's this, this matrix H. And look, I was a little sneaky about the way that I defined H, right? I said, if I and J are in your set of edges where you have information, then make it this number, and otherwise we're going to make it zero. Now, why did I do that? Well, take a look at what happens here. So if I put H, I, J there, right? Well, as long as the sum is over edges, then it's still just e to the i delta ij, right? And now, what happens if I just make the sum over all possible i and j? Well, we have two cases, right? Either ij is in the set of edges, in which case this is the number you get, or it's not, and h ij equals zero, yeah? So in other words, I can write this as the real part of the sum over all i and j. I don't have to worry about that set of edges anymore. Z i bar h i j z j. Now life is looking pretty good. Yeah. Okay. This thing kind of looks like a matrix that we've dealt with a lot in this class, right? It's, it's a quadratic form, right? We have an i, i j, and a j. This is a whole quadratic function, right? And if, if you think about it, this is like taking, if you think of all the z's as sitting in one long vector, then this is like the transpose of z times h times z. So there's a conjugate sitting on top. Yeah? Uh, we have special notation in linear algebra for conjugate transpose. Right? Uh, so we can say that this is the real part of z, where, in case you haven't seen it before, z star is z bar. Now in this notation, we're, we're looking pretty good, yeah? Like, life, life, life is getting a lot better. Uh, and in particular, can anybody spot, do I actually need this real part anymore? So, so let's make, let's put one additional assumption on my set of deltas, which is a totally reasonable assumption, 
which is that delta ij equals minus delta ji. Yeah. So in other words, for every edge ij, I also have another edge ji, and these two numbers agree up to sign. You see why there's a minus here? Yeah. So what does that tell me about my matrix H? Well, in particular, uh, there's something, some relationship between H i j and H j i, right? Uh, the the H i j, H j i, well, they're e to the minus each other. Yeah. And in other words, these are conjugates. Yeah. So uh, that tells us that H uh, is equal to or rather, that's the best way to put this. It's equal to his conjugate transpose. Yeah. <laughs> I always confuse myself. Um, now, do you, does anybody know why I call this matrix H, by the way? It's Hermitian. Yeah, that's the word for matrices. Yeah. And in particular, Hermitian matrices, they're kind of like the complex world version of symmetric matrix. Right? It's pretty close to being symmetric, it's just this pesky bar here. Um, in particular, uh, what we know is that they have a full set of eigenvalues, and that those eigenvalues are all real. Yeah? And what that implies is that this number for any z is just real for a free. So I, I don't actually need uh, this real operator, here, but this is just equal to. Which kind of nice. Yeah? Okay, so. Uh, now we're in good shape, right? I mean, the, we, we started with the messy objective function, we ended up with something like this. Yeah, uh, messy. Sorry, I missed that. Why is the real for three? Ah, I gotta make me defend myself. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, one way to think about it, yeah, so the easy way to think about it is to, to, to think about for every ij term in this sum, there's also a ji term. And let's look at the sum of those two things, right? So we're gonna have, and I'm praying God this works out, uh, <laughs> we'll have z, i, e to the i delta j, z, j, yeah? And then, but we also, somewhere else in our sum, right, we have z, j bar, e to the i, but I can write delta j i, but remember we're going to assume that that's minus i, oh, there it is, okay, uh, like that, right? Now, I've written them in this order, but these aren't vectors anyway, these are just scalars, I can write them anywhere I want. So in particular, uh, I can say, okay, so this is e to the i delta i j z i z j bar. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, similarly here, I can say, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to notice I got every single conjugate wrong in this second expression. So I do that. So in other words, this is a number plus its conjugate, right? So in other words, this is like a plus bi plus a minus bi. So what I'm left with is just the real number. And, and so in this sum, because for every ij I have another ji, uh, at the end of the day this is a real number. So that's the way to see it without arguing about how we should choose. Um, isn't the number plus its conjugate two times the real number? Yeah, sure, whatever. But it's still real. <laughs> Sure, if you 
want to solve this, this very innocent looking small optimization problem, uh, it's MP hard. And the, the reason for that is that you have a bunch of unit norm constraints, right? There's one for every i. So this would be like one for every image in your set of molecule images. Yeah? And, that's, and that's no good at all. Yeah? Uh, in fact, I think it's MP hard to optimize with even three unit length constraints. Two, you're okay. I forget, there's some result there. You shouldn't quote me. I don't know how to do that. Okay. So the question is how do we relax it? Right? In other words, can we solve like, a problem that somehow has fewer constraints? That's, remember, that's what, when I say relaxation, like we talked about this before in, in the context of normalized cuts, for example, right? A relaxation of a problem is one where I remove some constraints uh, and I solve that and I hope that it's an approximation for the fully constrained problem. You know? uh, so, first of all, if I relax this max problem, what will happen to the objective? or remove constraints on this problem. They'll get bigger. Do you see that? So the way to think about it, right, so I have some, let's say that my, my set of unknowns is the board here, right, and I have some set of unknowns, and I have some set of constraints that keeps me in some region, yeah? Do you imagine if I remove constraints, then the region becomes bigger, right? There are fewer constraints, so there's more places you could be. So if I think of my objective function as like some gradient field, right? Then essentially, whereas I might have like run into the wall of my constraint set before, now maybe I get a, a different point. And that's what can go wrong with this class you know? That I remove constraints, so, so somehow I, I'm not guaranteed I get the answer. So what people do in the convex and, 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 and eigenvalue realization world is they prove conditions under which you get lucky. Right? In particular, uh, let's say that I have, you know, here's my, my problem. And my relaxed, ooh, let me see if I can do this. My relaxed constraint set looks like that. And the gradient of my objective looks like this. Right? And then what happens when I optimize this larger problem? Well, in fact, I still kind of ignored this giant piece down here anyway. And so I got lucky and, and I got the solution to my original problem. And, 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 and in the relaxation world, it's very easy to check if, you, if that happened or not. Right? So you solve the relaxed problem. And then you just check if this point happens to satisfy the original set of constraints. And if it does, then you know that you're also optimal for that problem, right? Because you solved somehow a bigger problem when you got the same answer. Does that make sense? So, and so we are not going to prove conditions under which this realization is tight, because those are very difficult and require a few lectures. But we will at least kind of motivate a few different relaxations of this problem and, and kind of sketch out like, roughly what you might expect it to do okay. Yeah. All right, so there are a lot of different ways to go uh, to relax this problem. But essentially, the, the issue now is that I have like mod z1 equals 1, mod z2 equals 1, right? I have one of those for every one of the z's. Yeah. And just for fun, I could square all these guys. Got any new So what happens if I sum all these constraints? So in other words, what do I get? If I have n, you know, You get it? Yeah? So certainly, if all these relationships are true, then this relationship is true as well. <laughs> yeah? So maybe what I do is I say, okay, rather than solving this problem here, what I'm going to do is solve it using this relaxed constraint. I'm just going to, I'm going to realize that the sum of their nodes is all equal to n. Yeah? Okay, so, so, so what happens in that case? So now, And notice that this is the same thing as just the norm of z as a vector squared. Is this problem familiar? Remember from normalized cuts? I have a quadratic form, I have a matrix, and I have a constraint on the norm of a vector. So what you can prove, in fact what we did prove for uh, for 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 that case, for, for normal cuts, you would one half there, but that obviously doesn't matter. Uh, is that z, uh, z satisfies a relationship that we all know about. Yeah? Now, the one difference between uh, this relaxed problem here and the normalized cuts one, remember the normalized cuts had a min there, here we have a max. Uh, can anybody kind of predict what the difference in the eigenvalue problem is? Before we wanted the smallest eigenvector, right? That's what we did in, in normalized cuts. So, so here we're going to want the biggest eigenvector. In fact, the nice thing is that that's actually easier to compute. Yeah. 
Um, and and it's, it's kind of a nice property. And I know I'm harping on this algorithm a little bit, but I think it's really elegant. And that actually, these, these synchronization problems come quite bad. Okay. And so what do you do when you solve this relaxation? Well, either you get lucky and you satisfy all these constraints. If you don't, then maybe you define some, some zi, which is just a z divided by its norm. And then you use that as some approximation of relative motion, right? So in order to just kind of kill your, your, the, the amount that you don't satisfy the constraints. And it turns out that statistically, under, under pretty weak assumptions of the way this graph was generated, this estimator does quite well for, for, for these, these relative things, which is kind of nice. OK. So, uh, and by the way, oh, sorry, one more thing. <laughs> and then, and then we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what this problem is doing. What happens if I multiply both sides of, let's say that I take z, and I replace it with e to the i theta for some theta times z. In other words, I take my estimate of all these points and I rotate it. Right? Notice that this relationship still holds. Right? So in fact, it's giving exactly the solution that I would kind of expect, which is that I only get something up to a rotation of the, of the whole set of, of objects. This is a constant scale. Cool. All right. Uh, as one kind of indicator of like what's going on in this problem and why it, why it kind of gives you an answer that you might think is, is nice or, or reasonable, despite how you relaxed it, one way to think about this is, is um, if you think about the algorithms for actually computing eigenvalues. Yeah? In particular, there's a really, really stupid algorithm for computing the biggest eigenvalue of a matrix. How, how many of you guys have, have seen this before? Not everybody, so that's okay. Um, right, so, hopefully it's okay. I'm recovering some of the proof after. Uh, <laughs> it's good you guys are keeping me up. Okay. Uh, right, so, here's the thing. Remember that, that H, because it's Hermitian by the spectral theorem, has a full set of eigenvalues, full set of eigenvectors. So let's take any vector x. And because it has a full set of eigenvectors and eigenvalues, I can always write them in that basis, right? I can always write that x is some linear combination of the eigenvectors. We'll call them v, where um, h times uh, vi, right? So I just compute all the eigenvectors of h, and I'm going to take an arbitrary vector x and write it in the h basis. That makes sense? I can always do that. That's an inspection of vectors. So what is h times x? Well, certainly by linearity, this is the sum over i of a i times h v i. Yeah. And well, by the eigenvalue uh, formula we have here, this is the sum a i lambda i i. Yeah. Now, what's h squared times this? Well, we're going to start with this one, multiply every term. We're going to have sum a i and i h. I and in there I get a i lambda i and h times b i again, so I get another lambda times b i. So in particular, if I take h to the one thousand times nice, I write it in the basis. What do I get? Anybody can take the picture? Yeah. So you just you, you just keep taking higher and higher powers of this guy. I take the thousandth power of a really big of, of a big number. It gets like really like like hell of it. Right? You get like a really really big number. You take the thousandth power and it's big. Right? So what happens if I take the thousandth power of a small number? Really small. Yeah? So so take a look at what this expression is telling me. Right? So uh, I have these different components of x, which are sitting in the different eigenvalue directions, and I'm amplifying them by a very large power of the corresponding eigenvalue, right? Just you. Yeah. So which term is going to dominate? It's going to be the term corresponding to the biggest lambda, because I'm taking a huge number, I'm taking it to a big power, and I'm scaling it times this, this constant v. Notice that v has no dependence on what x1 I have here. Yeah. So if I want to compute the eigenvector corresponding to the biggest eigenvalue of a matrix, how can I do it? Well. I say step one is I randomly generate some vector x. I randomly generate it because then with, with, with probability one, I have at least a little bit in every one of these vi directions, which is all I need, just a little bit. Yeah. And now I iterate, right? And 
instead of x, I replace that with h times x. This is my entire algorithm. Yeah. So in other words, it's like the world's most stupid sledgehammer. You see that? If I want to compute the biggest eigenvector of a matrix, what I do is I just keep hitting it with that matrix. And then what happens is I slowly amplify the part of that vector, which I'm just kind of hoping exists for my initial guess, parallels to the biggest eigenvector. Uh, yeah. Over to a lot of details of this algorithm. It's not a numerical class that, 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 that are important. For one thing, if, if lambda is bigger than 1 and I multiply it by like the billionth power of h, then pretty soon I'm going to overflow my, my numerical system. Yeah. So typically I add another step. Yeah. So I just divide it by its length each time and I use it. Multiply it by its length. So that way at least it's just over here. Okay. There's your five minute numerical analysis lecture. Okay. So, Right, and, and under pretty weak assumptions about H, uh, Hermitian is enough, uh, you'll, you'll get what you want. Uh, Hermitian and no repeated values, right? Otherwise, you'll get in trouble. Uh, uh, then then you get things. Yeah? Okay, so in, in practice, if I wanted to, to implement this algorithm for synchronization, it's real simple, right? What do I do? I compute this matrix H, which is just some formula and the input data that I have, and then I just start hammering a random vector with it for a long time, and slowly, if I'm lucky, I converge to the solution by synchronization. So, uh, okay, you might ask, well, why did I go to, I mean, so far in this class, we haven't usually given you the numerical methods for solving these. Why, why did I bother doing that here? Uh, and, and, and the reason is that actually, in this case, this eigenvalue iteration algorithm has a really nice uh, interpretation in the context of uh, synchronization. Okay? Uh, in, in particular, uh, let's, let's go back over here. I can do the last thing. So, so one thing you can you can check is like what is element i j of h squared? Well, uh, okay. So by definition of matrix multiplication, this is the sum of k h i k h k j. Yeah. And uh, now what are we going to do? We're going to go. We're going to work backward to our definition of, of h, which conveniently I have left on top. I was nervous I used it. So what I get is the sum over ij and jk, all in your set of edges, right? Uh, e to the i delta ik um, times e to the i delta k. You see that? That's just the definition of h. Okay. So here's the thing. Let's say that I have, I take my set of edges and I partition them into two sets. So I'm going to say that I have E good and E bad. Right? So E good is the set of edges for which my delta ij is correct, and E bad is the set of edges for which delta ij is just like some random bad number. Yeah. Okay. Then notice what happens. So let's say that ij or rather ik and kj are both in the set e good. Yeah? Then what happens, uh, well, yeah, what, what ends up happening? Well, in particular, what we know is that uh, what we want is delta ij plus delta jk plus delta ki equals zero, or whatever you say, okay? So in other words, if I have a bunch of good edges, then, 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 then this is the property that I end up having, right? And you guys might have seen this, this trick before in graph theory, right? That if you take the adjacency matrix of a graph and you take it to higher and higher powers, what you get are the length of different paths between vertices, like the number of paths of like two and the number of paths of like three and so on. The kind of similar thing happens here. You end up with cycles, right? Um, so in particular, uh, this sum here ends up being the number of k for which Because in that case, this whole thing when you exponentiate it gives you, it just gives you one, right? 
and then plus the sum over e bad of other stuff. Yeah. So essentially, the way to think about this eigenvalue iteration algorithm is that what it's doing is it's trying to amplify good cycles of things, right? Like first cycle is only three, then second is only four, and then second is only five every time I multiply by this matrix. And and the kind of neat thing is that as you make your cycles longer and longer and longer, essentially the, the proofs about like why this eigenvalue relaxation are, is, is working is that what you show is that the longer and longer cycles essentially the noisy edges destructively interfere, right? Like if I take a big uh, cycle and I sort of cancel out all of these different things in the sum, then somehow the bad terms just kind of cancel each other out and what you're left with is, is, is exactly the uh, consistent set, which is kind of nice. Now I promised you guys two different relaxations with this problem, so I'll really quickly mention the other one, which is also pretty easy. These are all kind of stupid tricks uh, in the world of convex stuff. Uh, Right, so uh, I better leave that and that and that. Shoot. Um, uh, I'll do a little bit of tree last year. Okay. Uh, right, so for my next trick, I'm going to define a new variable which is called capital theta. And uh, that's going to be a matrix uh, whose elements are e to the i theta i minus theta j. Notice that this looks an awful like an h, right? This is like what I want h to look like. Yeah? Um, or a different way of putting that, which is exactly the same. Let's so just say that this is equal to z times z star. This is the outer product of z in itself. Yeah? Uh, so, right. So what can we say about this, this matrix capital theta? Well, there's a couple things, right? So for one thing, we know, um, what are the diagonal elements of this matrix? One, right, because it's theta i minus theta i is zero, so you have e to the zero. Yeah. And the other one is, remember that our objective function for our optimization looked like uh, sum over ij e to the minus i theta i times h i j e to the Right? This is our thing we want to maximize. Well, notice that you can write this in a really nice way. This is equal to the trace of h times capital theta. Yeah. So uh, you, you can see that because remember that the, the trace of two things is kind of like the, the dot product of, of the transpose of one of these guys and the other one. And, and notice that this is the dot product of h i j times yeah, theta i j. So it all kind of works out. Okay. So, uh, Right, so at the end of the day, what this means is that we can write our uh, optimization problem in a nice way. Uh, oh, and there's actually this one, I'm sorry, there's one more thing I can notice about this, uh, this matrix, which is uh, that this matrix is semi definite. You see that? So, in particular, I can never draw this symbol, but I'm going to try. There you go. That's uh, the symbol for semi definite. <laughs> Right. And, and how can I tell that? Well, so remember the, the semi-definite means that I take the dot product with respect to your matrix so you get a positive number or a negative one. So in particular, let's say I do V. Uh, now we're in the complex world, so I have to do conjugate transpose Z, Z star, V, like that. Yeah. Let's group this a little differently. This is V or Z. Now this number is just a scalar, right? So it's like there's two terms here. This is this number squared. Diagonal elements of this, this thing are all one, 
right? Uh, this matrix is semi-definite. Okay, good. Uh, and I need a third one, which is that what I really need is that this is equal to z, z stuff. That's what I really want at the end of the day. And as long as I have the, all these constraints, I've actually solved my original problem. Do you see that? Because diagonal theta equals 1, if I have this, this last constraint here, the same for the norm of each of the z's is equal to 1. Right? Think about the diagonal of this matrix, z, z star, which is equal to the square complex norm. So this is exactly equivalent to our uh, problem all the way up in the upper left. So, what's another convex relaxation principle? It's quite simple. All I do is I say, well, this is just kind of annoying. So maybe I just slash him out. And then what I'm left with is it's a convex problem, right? This is a linear constraint, it just fixes uh, certain elements of our matrix. We, I argue to you guys that this is a convex thing, right? And, and this objective is, is just linear, right? Uh, so at the end of the day, uh, one thing you can show is that this is actually a slightly tighter relaxation than the eigenvalue one. Um, in other words, that you can sort of take every solution to the eigenvalue problem and plug it in here um, to get some matrix theta, all right? So you kind of expect a, a, a set of their bounds. But in practice, they seem to give very similar results. Right? So what you do, uh, at the end of the day, you can solve this semi-definite program. You get some matrix theta. And what is your certificate as to whether you were optimal? Before, you were optimal if you solve the eigenvalue problem, you just happen to get that every element has norm 1. Now it's slightly different. Your certificate for optimality is you check if the rank of theta is equal to 1. Yeah? And if it is, then life is good and you solve your problem. If it isn't, then you kind of throw up your hands and say, ah, eh, well, too bad. Yeah? So this is the world of complex relaxation. You come up with some complex problem um, that realizes the one that you really wanted to solve. You solve that, and if you're lucky and it solves your last constraint, then you're done. And otherwise, you need to go to a lot of work to, to figure out what to do. <laughs> but it turns out for this particular set of problems, there's a very wide class of input data for which is a very good relaxation. And I'll refer you guys to this bit, which is actually very readable, um, which is kind of nice. What it does is it enumerates all kinds of different statistical models and shows how under each one there are really nice uh, conditions for, for exactly that. Now, notice we went to a ton of work just now. And let's, let's stop back for a second. Remember we had this lecture on ICP, and what we really wanted was to register a bunch of 3D scans consistently. And what I just argued to you guys is, for this 2D problem, where I've thrown away translation, it's already really hard. <laughs> Do you see that? that like, somehow this, this smells like an easy problem. I just have relative rotations, like little angles, and I want to rectify them. It doesn't seem like it should be that difficult. And somehow, even in this case, uh, it becomes really, really challenging. And so I'll, I'll, I sort of have two reasons to go through all this math. One is just because this is a really cool idea and it shows up a lot. Um, the other is to argue that, like, this is a ridiculously hard problem. And, and if you guys are looking for good research problems to think about, this is what's staring you in the face. It's, it's sort of how do you deal with, with uh, sort of consistent registration when you have more than two scans? Uh, it's like one of these problems everybody, I think, thinks of as solved, and it really isn't in any kind of global way. Okay. So uh, anyway, that's that. Do you guys have any questions before we, we move on? Sorry, I don't know if I missed your report. Did you say that someone's done something similar for 3D? Or ah, no, yes. Yeah, so for 3D rotation, yeah, I'm sorry, oh, I forgot to, to mention that. Translation. Yeah. Okay. So it turns out that this SDP relaxation is quite nice for that, right? Okay. So one thing I could do, excellent question. But it's, it's uh, let's say now my unknown. So what would it be? Instead of thetas, it would be a bunch of R I's, right? where each of these guys is in um, SO3, like a, a rotation. And so now my input data would be Rij, which is like the rotation from I to J. Uh, and, and, and what I really want, oh gosh, I want to see this backward. Uh, now my relationship instead of like delta Ij equals theta I minus theta J mod 2 pi, what I want is that Rij looks like R, oh gosh, J, R, I, transpose. <laughs> right, so kind of uh, the rotation from I to J is kind of like rotating I into a coordinate space and then rotating into the space of J. Depending on how you define the R's, these might be transposed into each other. Right? Um, so this is the relationship you want, and this is again a really hard one to satisfy, right? This is you have a product of unknowns. And, uh, okay. Uh, and the reason is, let's say that I do and I have some other rotation matrix, and I do that to all of my R's, then what happens? They cancel out 
one side of this relationship. This is exactly the same as like I can take my clock face and rotate it, and, and the synchronization problem doesn't change. You shouldn't trust my transposes here. I wish we were wrong. But anyway, for this uh, STP problem, um, what could I do? Well, I could do the, exactly this outer product trick, but every time I add a complex number over here, I'm going to have like a little 3 by 3 matrix here. So at the end of the day, my unknown semi-definite matrix will be one that looks like, uh, you know, whose elements kind of look like R, I, R, J, transpose. Am I getting this backward? It doesn't. Um, and, 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 and essentially, what do I, I think of this as like a block 3 by 3 matrix that gives you the relative motion between every pair of 3D objects. And what do I know about the diagonal of this matrix? It's a bunch of little 3 by 3 identity matrices. Right? So this is very similar to our old problem, but now just lifted to s uh, And what do I know about the rank of this matrix? What is the rank of this matrix? So think about it. It's, it's the outer. So let's say that I took all of my R's, and I stacked them like that, right? I call this matrix M, right? And he's going to be in R uh, three times the number of molecules by three. Yeah? Then this matrix would be M M transpose. Notice I've already got my transposes backward, but we're just not about it. Actually, I have it. I'm so consistent today. Good. Uh, then. Uh, what is the rank of this matrix? And I just factored it, and I factored it using something that has three columns. So it's still good rank three. Right? Um, so at the end of the day, you have a very similar problem, but at the end of the day, you, you have to come with a right analog of H, which is not so hard to do, it's, it's essentially the same. Um, you have this diagonal, but now instead of ones, you have identity matrices. You have semi-definite still, right? Because it looks like MM transpose. Yeah, and then the constraint that you draw is not rank one, but rank three. That's what's very close. Uh, and then there are all kinds of extensions beyond that problem. Right? I, I mean, you can uh, try to prove uh, conditions in which this has recovery, or you can try to add constraints to it. There are all kinds of cool stuff. Maybe we talk about mapping, and we'll uh, do a comment relaxation of that too. Uh, okay. Cool. So that concludes our, our, our messy map. Now we're going to go back to nice graphics pictures for a little while, uh, and, and then be, uh, be done for the day. Yeah? Um, so, of course, all of this work that we've done uh, is all for a rigid registration. This is for like taking a rigid object and just kind of rigidly sticking on top of another one. And the obvious question here is, like, if I have bendy objects, what do I do with those? Uh, uh, I would say for that problem, nobody has even thought about all these, these relaxations. That would be very messy, right? I mean, you would have to deal with a lot of different variables. But uh, there are plenty of people that think about uh, what we call non-rigid registration, right? So the, uh, the obvious use case here would be, like, you have your, 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 you know, somebody's talking and their mouth is moving and you're trying to align the face from frame to frame, but you don't expect there to just be rigid motion of one face on another because your mouth is changing shape as you talk. Yeah? I hope. And uh, so, so now you need some non-rigidity here. In other words, at the same time that you're kind of finding a global 3D motion of one object into the other, you also kind of have to bend one object into the other so they align. Yeah? And this is a horrible, horrible problem. Uh, I keep saying this today. But this, is, this really is, that, uh, like somehow, I mean, underneath it all, even if it weren't non-rigid, you have this, this messy theory to deal with. And, and on top of that, you have to deal with, like, what does non-rigid mean? Does it mean, like, that you can bend and stretch? Does it mean you hinge about certain points? Uh, every one of these is a different model, and it really depends on exactly the kind of data you have. Right, so, so the typical problems that come up in this world are that you have noisy data, maybe you have holes in your acquisition, so I think this is some video sequence of, like, a person holding a bucket for some reason, but it shows up a lot in the, the, <laughs> the non-rigid registration world. Um, and they're like shaking the bucket around. I, don't, I wonder what's inside of the bucket. Um, and, and you don't have any correspondence between these shapes. Like you can't, it's not even clear that there should be one. Like if you stretch from one pose to another, then it's not clear what that map should be, right? Um, and, 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 and there's deformation to be done. Yeah, so this is, this is a messy problem. I'd say, whereas like these nice angular synchronization problems that show up in cryo-yum are, are maybe amenable to, to nice theory. Uh, this is, is not so, right? Uh, you're you're going to have to do a lot of it. Like, really understand your heart. Okay. So I thought for fun, I'd mention just one, uh, one research paper, uh, which I think is pretty well known, that, that, that uh, proposes a method called non-rigid ICP. You can see why I thought I'd uh, mention it, because it's very closely related to what we talked about last time. Okay. And, and um, this thing does show up. Like, I think Mark Pauly and Emily had a well, it wasn't my point. Uh, how, uh, 
some, some set of the authors here had a startup that was trying to do kind of extensions of this for like scanning you as you move and tracking your face and all that kind of cool stuff. So this was going to show up in, in, in the industry. Right, so here's our, our concrete example. So here we have two scans of, of, <laughs> of my colleague Hao. And uh, you can see that there's, there's missing data, for example, on the side of his face. Um, and really what you're looking for are the, the regions that overlap and you're trying to align them all at the same time. But the irritating part of this particular problem isn't just dealing with the fact that they don't overlap 100%, but also dealing with the fact that he's moved his head. Right? And apparently his 3D scanner couldn't deal with him wearing his shirt, which is, I don't know if that's enough. So, uh, right, so anyway, the, uh, you know, sort of this, this non-region ICP algorithm essentially takes the old ICP algorithm and extends it a little bit, right? So, the, uh, remember the old ICP algorithm finds points that match, tries to line them up rigidly, and then, and then uh, you know, iterates. Essentially, all this paper does is say, find points that overlap, right? Like, first detect where, where, where there's overlap and find the correspondence. So, it's like finding the matching points. Then maybe rigidly move yourself into place. And then we're going to add a third step, which is we're going to allow our service to deform a little bit to better align. Right? So in other words, like maybe your arm is bent a little bit from one frame to another. So I'm going to try and unbend it just a little bit because I think these points correspond in some way. So I have some additional energy function which measures how much I'm bending and stretching. And I'm going to say, well, I'll penalize that just a little bit as long as, as my motion is pretty uh, and, and that's the, the, the basic step here. And so the way that they think about it is that sort of each one of these steps helps each of the other ones. Right? That the better um, overlap you have, then somehow the easier it is to find correspondence because you just have to look into the local neighborhood. And similarly, if you have good correspondence, right, like even if you're not perfectly aligned, it's very easy to deform one surface onto another just by basically moving vertices to the points that, that, that correspond. And so everything helps everything really else here. By the way, remember I, I whined a lot about like how ICP is very uh, locally optimal. It was very hard to say anything global about it. Um, this is even more so, right? I mean, I'm introducing even more kind of unknowns in a very, very non complex problem. Right? I have these, these bending stretching images. But in practice, it works quite well, at least for, for faces and you know, people in front of connects, all that kind of thing. Yeah. So at the end of the day, this, uh, this pipeline uh, looks something like this. I borrowed this from, from House Slide. So what you do is, is, is quite close to IC, right? You do closest point, just like we have before. So you have two scans. You, you have some, you know, candidate for their alignment. You compute closest points, and then you have this pruning step, which says if your closest point is far away, ignore that match, right? Remember, we, we talked about that in our last lecture. Like, essentially, this deals with the fact that two scans might not overlap, right? So if they, you know, if, if one hand is missing its thumb, then I should just slice off the thumb and um, use it in my alignment problem. Then, I solved some messy global optimization problem. So, okay, I have all these closest points, they're all matched up to each other, and what do I want to minimize? Remember before, I minimized translation and rotation? Now my variable is going to be the position of every point on the source mesh mapped onto the target, and I'm going to minimize some deformation energy. So in other words, I'm going to measure how much the individual triangles or edges stretch out, and, and what I do is I solve a problem that says, I would like coherence to the match points that I have, but I also don't want that much stretch. So that's the optimization problem I solve. And then I say, it's kind of a corny little triangle here. It says, if I'm done, then I finish. And otherwise, I, I iterate. Yeah. <laughs> so presumably, if you look inside of this paper, they have some convergence test that tells you, like, OK, these points aren't moving anymore. It's settled, and, and we're done with them. So, so hopefully, the high level uh, story makes sense. And, and to give you kind of a rough summary of their objective function here, I, I would argue this is a super important. You could come up with many other ones. Um, roughly, what they say is that, this whole thing is some global optimization, just the same way that ICP right, is optimizing for rotation, translation, and match all at the same time, is one of the ways to understand it. Similarly with k-means, remember, you can assign every point to its mean and compute the mean all in one giant optimization algorithm. What we prove is that all the individual steps all are just like different ways to minimize that objective and different set of variables. You can do the same thing here, right? So your variables end up being the positions of the, the points on the surfaces that you're, you're aligning. And your objective functions end up being sort of two, uh, these two green guys are just the ones that we had before from ICP, right? So this is like this, you know, this point to plane distance, which is the one that, that I drew the picture of before. Then we add a third one, which is rigidity energy, right? So what you do, and we're going to talk about this a little bit in our, in our next lecture, so I'm going to defer, is you're going to look at the distortion of every triangle when it's mapped onto the other one. And if it rigidly moves, that energy is zero. And if the edges stretch out, then it becomes bigger. Uh, and then they have some other smoothing thing to make sure you don't get a totally crazy. Yeah. 
Uh, and so at the end of the day, their, their optimization says, okay, I match this stuff, I rigidly align, and then I do a few essential gradient descent steps on this really messy uh, uh, you know, deformation energy to improve stuff. And uh, essentially, I mean, I'm giving you a very fuzzy description of this algorithm because I think that's how you need. Like, you could, you could engineer a lot of different variants of this that I think would all work kind of equally or similarly well. Um, but really, the, the overall approach that you should be aware of is that it's sort of very similar to ICP. You grab your closest point, you deform your surface a little bit to kind of match those closest points, and you get it. Yeah. Um, there are lots of other approaches. So for example, uh, you could talk about template-based matching. So maybe I have frames of somebody dancing around in front of the 3D scanner, and then I additionally have like the proto dancer of like you know some 3D model that's complete and has all the information I need. And then my job is to map from that complete model into each of the dancing frames. That can be a slightly easier problem because it's a little easier to deal with missing information. Right? You only have missing information on one side. Um, and there are plenty of people that study that. Uh, in particular, in, in face tracking, right, this comes up a lot because it turns out that PCA, like physical component analysis on the set of faces, actually gives you something pretty reasonable. Okay? So what you do is you take a giant database of 3D faces and you give them all the same triangle mesh which is itself kind of an annoying problem, but one that, that people have kind of looked at the details. And then you say, okay, now I can think of all of faces, each face as like a point in Rn, which is giving a list of all the vertex positions. And I do PCA on that big matrix. This has a name, it's called blend shapes. Um, actually, it has a lot of names, right? It's called blend shapes, called morphable models. People in the computer vision plan have some other name for it. Um, but essentially, all it is is some linear subspace of faces that all have the same mesh. And then your job uh, in that world becomes essentially similar to how at least, you know, this, this non-major registration problem. But you constrain yourself to sit in the set of, of meshes that are in this linear subspace that, that, that you compute. Uh, and this is really nice for, for like face tracking in front of a camera, right? Because typically with just 100 PCA vectors, you can capture like most kind of mouth and eye motions pretty well. Uh, and so at the end of the day, you only need 100 coefficients to compute. And then you have some hope of being able to do that at 30 frames a second. Right? Whereas like, if you're trying to not rigidly align these meshes using this very nonlinear pipeline, that, as you can imagine, can take quite a long time. Yeah. Um, right. Uh, so uh, again, this is, you know, in the last couple of weeks of the course, we're really hitting what I would consider to be kind of the frontier in a lot of geometry problems, and there's a lot of open things left. Right? And so um, some of the, the interesting challenges here are like, you know, if you put somebody in this like, sombrero, or you have them standing in front of, you know, some, something that, that's in between the person and the camera. You want to, now you want to solve a combination of like the last three lectures of this class. Right? You want to cluster all the points of the scan based on whether they're the chair or the human. Then you want to reconstruct the human. And then you want to take that human and align it to your proto-human in your database. Uh, all of these are individual steps that we've covered, but putting them together is, is quite challenging, especially in an optimal way. Right? Um, additional challenges include like 3D scanners don't always work. Uh, in particular, you know, models like the, this thing from CryoEM assume basically Gaussian noise, right? They assume that your noise is very incoherent. But in reality, uh, you know, as, 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 like typically when I get 3D scanned, I like to be wearing a sequin dress because I know that that's going to throw off the 3D scan right? <laughs> completely, right? Because you're, you're bouncing light every which way, and, and there's no hope of this nice, you know, signal coming back to the device to get depth information. And so dealing with things like environment and lighting and materials and so on can really put a big hole in your, your 3D reconstruction. And to make matters worse, I mean, it, it leads to noise in your scan, but instead of just a kind of random noise, like incoherent noise, it's very coherent noise, right? It has to do with geometry, the materials you're wearing. Like maybe I have a shirt that's like striped and every other stripe is, is made out of metal, you know, like plastic wrap or something. I have a whole wardrobe full of things that throw out 3D scans. And, uh, Essentially, you know, for each one of those things, you need a different reconstruction. Of this is really challenging stuff. Uh, and then finally, uh, you know, what we, you know, the, at, at the end of the day, the really, uh, you know, you get the gold medal if you can do this all with a really low cost, the cost scan. Right? So, for instance, uh, the Microsoft Connect is a very popular one. It's this device that can, you know, attach to your Xbox and, and give you just enough 3D information to be frustrating, right? Like, I mean, you, you know, essentially, like if you look at this model that comes out of the Connect. You know, what people like me would really like to do would be compute, you know, heat kernels and do differential geometry, but there's just no way on that on that 3D model that you get any interesting signal, right? So I would say taking any of the stuff that we talked about uh, in the last couple of weeks of this class and extending it to incomplete, messy, noisy scans where you only have you know part of the information and you can't trust it and your noise is coherent, 
is really uh, unsolved, and it shows up in all kinds of contexts, right? Uh, obviously, our bias here is in the computer graphics world, but you end up with a very similar issue with somebody in an MRI or an X, you know, X-ray scan. You also have a noise that has to do with your, your, your measurement device. Yeah. So I think, let's see, yeah, it's, uh, it's about 2.30, so we'll stop here, and then next time we're going to talk about the most non-rigid version of correspondence, where I'm going to do all of my calculations intrinsically, right? So I have like two metric spaces and I want to line them up like a horse and a giraffe. And I expect there's some shared structure, but I don't expect that I can get it just by kind of stretching one thing onto another. Uh, yeah. So uh, please work on your help.